Okay, so let's jump right into uh, chronic management of heart failure. And my intent here is just to quickly go over what's accepted as, as guideline-directed therapy now for, uh, for, for more than a decade and highlight the two recent updates related to two new medicines approved by the FDA for patients with heart failure with uh, reduced EF that I want you to consider as you're seeing patients in the outpatient setting or at the time of discharge when they're rendered uh, uvolemic. And so this uh, practice guideline document was, was referenced uh, before, and, and I think it's a good source as you go through your training, not only to understand outpatient uh, guideline uh, recommendations, but inpatient as well. So we're, we're really, what I'm going to focus in on is heart failure with reduced EF, and the working cutoff, if you will, for ejection fraction is less than or equal to 40%, that gray zone between 40 and 49, borderline uh, heart failure with preserved EF. And we all know that the, there's inter-intra-observer variability with measuring EF, so I wouldn't get caught up if, you know, you're struggling between 39 and 42 to implement uh, heart failure. Is, you know, it's between around 5% or up to 10%, depending upon which institution you work. But heart failure reduced EF as a syndrome, uh, symptoms and signs of heart failure with an EF less than 40%, you're going to want to consider those class 1 uh, recommendations. And we've talked about uh, the different insults that can lead to compromised myocardial dysfunction, which is associated with a revved up neurohormonal response. Um, these are de uh, de uh, delirious uh, effects related to sympathetic stimulation, renin-angiotensin, that, it, that account for the abnormal hemodynamics that define heart failure. And we know as the heart remodels, LV size does matter and pretends a worse prognosis. This has been exemplified in a, in a number of studies. So the aim is certainly when you're meeting a patient to alter the natural history. You want to curb the natural progression and improve survival and improve the morbidity that defines the syndrome. So since the, the, the early 1990s, certainly ACE was the forefront with re relative 28% uh, reduction in survival, then beta blockers in the mid-90s, an additional 30-plus uh, uh, percent of benefit in terms of reduction of, of uh, uh, mortality, and then aldosterone uh, blockade being key. And then I'll, I'll show you the relative risk reductions associated with Entresto uh, in particular as it relates to mortality later on in this, in this talk. So we know there's a survival advantage with ACE uh, or ARB, aldosterone uh, a blockade in patients with heart failure reduced EF, um, with class two to three um, symptoms and, and beta blockers. Now, in terms of potentially reverse remodeling, decreasing the heart size and improving function, uh, demonstrable benefits with ACE or ARB and, and beta blockers. And I mentioned, you know, we're talk, focusing in for this particular talk, heart failure with reduced EF. And we stage these patients. Certainly, I think it's important to keep in mind when you're seeing in clinic those patients with risk factors to develop heart failure, namely hypertension and diabetes. Um, you know, these are earlier stage, patient stage A. Uh, the real focus in terms of guideline-directed therapy with specific recommendations relates to stage a C, and that's someone with structural dysfunction with a prior or current heart failure symptom. So they could be New York Heart Class 1 but had a hospitalization within the prior year with an EF less than 40%. They're a stage C. Now, so, so, so I think that's important to keep in mind because you're going to want to use the appropriate medical therapy. This staging system doesn't replace the New York Heart Class. Patients can transition from four to one, right, even within the hospital setting. That's the aim is to, is to palliate uh, congestion. And so the staging system really helps you understand uh, which medicines for, for which patients. And here's the classification of, of heart failure that I am uh, referencing. Now, unfortunately, for the vast majority of patients, this is a progressive disorder um, with mortality, you know, from the onset of diagnosis of, uh, of, of as high as 40, 50 percent when you're projecting three to five year uh, mortality for, for our comers. And stage uh, D heart failure, again, a diagnosis we don't take lightly, it's really a, a syndrome where those that are um, having persistent high-grade symptoms, you're using the guideline-directed therapy or the patients can't tolerate it, where you're going to want to consider end-organ interventions, transplant, or LVAD. So briefly, level of evidence, class one, that benefits significantly outweigh the risk and this should be uh, implemented. That's versus a class two way where it may be reasonable to consider. Level of evidence A, typically multiple populations evaluated, for example, more than one randomized trial. Level of evidence B, as it relates to Entresto, even from a single randomized trial of large enough. Um, so this is important to keep in mind when you're looking at the details. For stage A, really control blood pressure, 
um, and lip is no specifics in terms of which uh, medicines uh, to do that, but you want to keep systolic blood pressure certainly under 130. And, and for those with underlying uh, coronary artery disease, um, use statins and, 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 and beta blockers um, appropriately. Um, I mentioned ACE was a first line uh, uh, agent back in the er early 90s, and all cause mortality was significantly improved on an allopril, as well as death or heart failure hospitalization. And this was true even in those patients that were less symptomatic with, um, um, as it relates to death or heart failure hospitalization. Dose does matter. This holds true for both ACE and beta blocker. Now, as it relates to ACE, this is the ATLAS trial. Um, it's not that all-cause mortality was reduced with higher ACE, but importantly, um, all-cause mortality in a composite of hospitalization or hospitalization for heart failure or vascular reason was improved. So if the patient has enough blood pressure, uh, try to use those dosages that were used in the clinical trials as it relates to the ACE inhibitors. So for stage C, heart failure reduced the F, ACE uh, or ACE intolerant uh, ARB is first line. You do not want to uh, combine both ACE, ARB, and aldosterone antagonism in fear of uh, hyperkalemia. So beta blockers, cornerstone treatment. Here are the four trials that put it on the map with significant risk reductions in, in mortality. So it's a class one recommendation. At your disposal, bispropolol, carvedilol, or sustained release metoprolol succinate as opposed to tartrate um, is recommended. We typically are choosing between either carvedilol or uh, toprolol XL. And this is, where, this is an, what we often see when patients are referred. They're on, in, they're on what I would qualify as inadequate dosages. The carvedilol dose, based on clinical trials, 25 milligrams twice a day. That's 50 milligrams a day. BMI over 35, you can exceed that. For toprolol XL, it's 200 milligrams a day. So if I see a patient referred for advanced heart failure, New York heart class 2, no excess volume on exam, EF, you know, 25%, and they're on carvedilol 6.25 twice a day. First thing I'm doing is up titrating their carvedilol and swallowing them in increments of two weeks to ensure tolerability um, as you have a better chance of, of, of reverse remodeling or altering that natural progression. Some nuance between metoprolol and carvedilol, those patients with, uh, with uh, uh, bronchospasm, given that the carvedilol has more uh, effect on uh, more, more receptors, you can provoke uh, uh, asthma, we use metoprolol succinate in those with concomitant lung uh, disease. Carvedilol will give you more blood pressure reduction, so it's going to be helpful for those hypertensive patients. Don't forget about the aldosterone uh, antagonism as derived from the RAILS trial, self-identified African-American males with class 3 symptoms, a survival advantage, 30% mortality uh, reduction, and this is a class 1 um, <laughs> recommendation. And again, you don't want to use all um, uh, ACE and ARB and aldosterone antagonism because of the fear for hyperkalemia. And this stems from the AHEF trial in terms of uh, using, uh, uh, for example, spironolactone. Again, mortality, um, uh, forgive me, uh, let me go back. That's, yeah, that's the AHEF trial in terms of hydralazine and, and isardil and self-identified African-Americans with a survival advantage. So I'm going to jump, in, given the time, um, to the recent updates as it relates to Entresto and Coronor. And so neprilysin is a, is a um, peptide that has a, a disadvantage effect of, of minimizing endogenous vasoactive peptides, for example, brain nephritic peptide uh, BNP. And we know endogenous BNP is favorable, right? It's counter, counterbalances the, the adverse effects of increased sympathetic tone and renin-angiotensin system. So it increases naturesis, minimizes fibrosis. So neprilysin inhibition will, will minimize degradation of endogenous uh, brain natriuretic peptides. And so is in theory, this could potentially be very uh, helpful. And this was studied in a landmark largest heart failure trial to date, Paradigm um, Heart Failure, uh, where in Tresto, the name LCZ696, was compared to guideline-directed evidence-based therapy in dose and allopril. And it was a head-to-head. -head. There was a run-in phase to ensure appropriate comparison of, of goal-directed anonalapril in, in, uh, in trusted 200 milligrams uh, twice a day. And the criteria was um, class 2 to 3 heart failure. There were just a few percentages of patients with class 4. Ejection fraction originally was less than 40%. That was later on in the trial reduced to 35%. And surrogates f uh, of, of uh, elevated BNP and being on guideline-directed therapy. 
This is the take home slide, the primary endpoint. There is a 20% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And this was seen throughout all subgroups. Very powerful is that both cardiovascular death or end mortality, in addition to indiv uh, the individual uh, metrics of heart failure hospitalization, were all reduced in those on LCZ 696 compared to Entresto. So the number needed to treat uh, to prevent one cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization is just 21. And so this is really profound and has changed the guidelines. It actually was um, associated with less discontinuation compared to enalapril in the run-in phase. So we think it's at least as equally um, 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 safe. I should highlight that in, uh, in African Americans, the incidence of angioedema was a little higher compared to uh, enalapril. Um, and so you want to be cognizant in, in, uh, of that. But a very well tolerated medicine, it does reduce the blood pressure a little bit more than enalapril alone because of the uh, concomitant neprilysin inhibition plus angiotensin II, which is the two components of the drug, lead to more vasodilation. So you want to be cognizant of lower, the lowering blood pressure effect in terms of adverse events. But this could be actually very favorable, especially for those that have relatively higher blood pressure. So it's a class one level evidence B, just one randomized trial. And it is um, um, recommended, and this is very, very uh, strong, as replacement for ACE or ARB in those that are near a CAR class two or three. So we know it's ACE, ARB, or the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibition blockade and, and spironolactone, right, all have mortality benefits. But for those that are stable near a CAR class two or three, tolerating ACE or ARB, recommendation for replacement. So you can imagine what this means for you in, when seeing these patients in terms of transitions. And I think it's important to keep in mind if they're on an ACE, you, you, you don't want to overlap the medications. You wait for a 36-hour washout period and then um, up titrate them uh, to the goal dose used in the, in the trial. Now, lastly, the ivabradine for, for heart failure or Corlinor. This is a, a unique underlying mechanism. It binds the funny child a funny channel, which is located in the sinoatrial node predominantly, and it reduces the slope for diastolic depolarization, so it delays the next subsequent heartbeat, and thereby decreases the heart rate. And this is not a, a negative uh, onotrope. Uh, it really reduces the heart rate in a unique uh, uh, fashion. So I think this is, this is uh, key to, to remember. And this was studied in, in uh, a significant trial, the SHIFT trial, which was published now uh, several years back. Um, in Lanson, where the primary composite endpoint was cardiovascular death or hospital admission for worsening heart failure. And compared to placebo, avabradine was associated with 18% relative risk reduction. This was not driven by mortality. This was driven by reducing heart failure hospitalization. Um, and so when you look at hospitalization for heart failure, really a 26% relative risk reduction when compared to placebo. And these were patients that were New York heart class 2 to 3, 2 to 4. Um, EF less than 35%, importantly, in sinus rhythm with a heart rate above 70 beats per minute, and they excluded uh, uh, key patients as it related to recent acute coronary syndrome. These patients had to be on background medical therapy. So this is not replacement therapy. This is add-on therapy. And now of note, only 25% studied were on optimal doses of beta blockers. So it's important to keep in mind if you're seeing someone on less than gold, dose, gold doses of beta blocker and they're uvolemic to up-titrate the beta blocker first, then reconsider Corlin or if, they're, if they have persistent symptoms, two, two to four. And so the guideline recommendation for Corlinor is a 2A level of evidence B as it relates to reducing heart failure hospitalization for patients with class two to three heart failure, EF less than 75%. Um, again, it's add-on uh, therapy. So these are two key highlights, um, uh, and you can review that document uh, both for inpatient and outpatient recommendations. And again, I appreciate your attention.